This is C++ Lecture 4, Decision Making. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial license. All right, so we've looked at how to display. We've looked at how to get input from the uh, keyboard. We are now going to look at how to make decisions in our programs. And this is the beginning, if you will, of artificial intelligence. This is giving the computer, the program, the ability to perform different actions based upon uh, conditions that we enter or they get entered into the program. In order to make decisions in C++, we have to compare things. We have these relational operators that we can use for making comparisons. So let's go through the relational operators. We'll look at some examples on, on what you get when you compare, and then we'll look at how do you actually use these in the code. So first of all, we have uh, less than greater than, and here's some examples, so you can compare any two items. This, uh, for example, this might be a variable, and we're comparing the variable to a literal value. So, uh, is age less than 30? There's the comparison. And here's another example, is height greater than some constant? Remember we talked about constants, so there's a constant we've previous, uh, previously declared somewhere. Uh, less than or equal, and whenever you have uh, uh, these operators that, that are comprised of two symbols, there's never a space between those. So it's the less than and then the equal sign. So less than or equal to, and another example of that, uh, greater than or equal. Equal to, and notice uh, two equal signs. Uh, there's a distinction made in C++ between doing a comparison, that is, are two things equal, or using the equal sign as an assignment operator, which we've already seen. So one equal sign was take the items on the right and store it into the variable on the left. Two equal signs does a test. It doesn't do any assignment. It just says, are these two things equal? So here's an example of that. Uh, does the variable grade contain the number 100? So that's an example of comparing. And then not equal to is exclamation point equal sign. So are these not equal? Do they contain different values? All of these operators, when you use them, uh, the way we see over here in these examples, they result in either a true or a false. So in, in your program, you would include a statement that did one of these tests, and the result of that test would be true or false, based upon whatever the variables or values that you're comparing. We can compare characters. We don't have to restrict ourselves to comparing numbers only. We can compare characters. Uh, characters, remember we talked about the character uh, type, C-H-A-R was the type. Characters are stored uh, in C++ as binary numbers, as, as everything else. And when you were talking about comparing characters, we're talking about comparing them alphabetically. And so for example, we can say, we can do a comparison. Uh, the character, uh, remember again, the character was designated, uh, a literal character was designated with single quotes. A character, capital A, we can say, is that less than uh, the character, capital B, and it will return true. So alphabetically, A occurs before B, and it does, so it does return true. Now, why is that? I mean, it's, they're not actually letters, they're, they're, again, they're stored as numbers. The numbering scheme that C++ uses uh, for storing characters is the ASCII code, which is just a table that designates uh, here's the number that represents this character and here's the number that represents this character. So each each uh, letter, each uh, uh, punctuation mark, basically all the displayable characters on the keyboard have a corresponding number uh, in the ASCII code. So the ASCII code for capital A is the number uh, in decimal 65. The ASCII code for capital B is decimal 66. And so what it's really comparing is it's simply comparing the numbers. And so when you say, uh, in your program, when you say, is the letter capital A less than capital B, it says true, because what it's really comparing is, it's comparing the numbers. So it's comparing 65, which is the ASCII code for capital A, and 66, which is the ASCII code for capital B. And so we can, in fact, use that for sorting things alphabetically. Now you got to be careful uh, because the uppercase and lowercase letters have different numbers. 
So there's a number uh, uppercase for uppercase A is 65. For lowercase A has a different number. And lowercase A in ASCII is 97. So the, the comparison uh, will not work alphabetically if you have mixed case letters. That is, for example, if you compared a capital B with lowercase a, that, that comparison won't work. Capital B is, is the number 66. Lowercase a is the number 97. So alphabetically, if you say, how does capital B compared to lowercase a, it's going to say capital B occurs before lowercase a. So just make sure when you're comparing letters uh, in C++ that you only compare letters of the same case. As long as they're all lowercase, the comparison works because uh, lowercase b, I didn't put it here in the PowerPoint, but lowercase b is the next number up, so it's 98. So lowercase compares will work, uppercase compares will work. Just don't mix them and you'll be fine. In addition to the relational operators, so the less thans and the greater thans, we also have some logical operators. And so we have logical and, and the symbol, the operator for uh, logical and is two ampersands. And so here we see we have uh, exp1, which I just I put in there that stands for expression. So we have some relational expression that results in a true or a false. Uh, here's an example. Let's say we had age greater than 40. So there's an, a, a relational expression, and that's going to be either true or false. And we have another expression, an example a term less than 10. So this, uh, this term, the, the one on the left, is either true or false. And the one on the right is either true or false. And then those, after they're, they're evaluated, the, the logical AND is performed. And so logical AND combines these two results. So all of this now is going to be combined into either a true or a false using a logical AND. Here's the, the uh, truth table that's called for logical AND. So what does logical AND do given two terms? So here are the two expressions, uh, one and two. And here's all the possible combinations of true and false for the two expressions. And we're going to logical AND those together. And here's the result. And as you can see, you only get true as a result from logical AND when both of the input terms are true. Any other combination of true-false inputs results in a false output. So in our example, this entire expression will be true if age greater than 40 is true, term less than 10 is true, and then those two are added together, then the entire expression will be true. That's what this says here. So expression 1 is true, expression 2 is true. You logical and those together, you get true as a result. If you had faults on, on either side or both sides were false, the entire expression is false. Okay, we also have a logical operator OR. And the symbol for logical OR is two uh, pipe symbols or vertical bars. And depending upon the font that's being used, again, it may look like there's a space in here, but there's not a space. It's just uh, two of these symbols back to back. Uh, this symbol is uh, on your keyboard. It's the uh, shift of the backslash character. So the, in more, most keyboards, uh, you'll have the backslash character, and then the shift of that will be this vertical bar. And uh, depending upon the keyboard, it may appear as a dashed vertical bar instead of a solid bar. So it'll, it'll either look like the key will look like this, or the key will look like this, maybe with a dashed vertical bar uh, above it. And maybe it's in a different spot depending on the keyboard. But that's the character. Uh, so two of those, and that's logical or. And again, you have you use that with uh, relational expressions. So again, this uh, is true or false, and this is true or false, and we're going to OR that result together. So this entire expression becomes either true or false after you do the logical OR. And here's the truth table uh, for logical OR. So with, with logical OR, you get false as a result when both inputs are false. But any other combination of inputs, if there's a true anywhere, any, any input or both inputs is true, then you get true as a result. And so that's logical or. Then we have the logical not operator, and that's the exclamation point. 
So it's just simply exclamation point and then expression. So again, any expression that uh, it results in a true or false, you can, you can invert the logic, if you will, by putting an exclamation point or a logical not in front of that. And so now this is the opposite. So if age greater than 40 was false, and you say uh, not that, then it becomes true. So it's just the opposite logic. So now we've added uh, operators uh, to our list. And here's again is a table of operator precedents, including all the operators we've talked about up to this point. So we just added these. We added the relational operators, greater thans and less thans. We added uh, equal to, not equal to, and you can see there are different precedents for those two rows. Again, the higher uh, the rows, the higher the precedence. So these operators are evaluated first and then uh, across the expression going down to the lower uh, rows. So then following the relational operators, next we have logical and and then logical or. So those are the operators we just added. And you can see the, uh, the evaluation of those operators is normally left to right uh, with a few example, a few exceptions uh, which we saw for the uh, increment and decrement operators. All right, so we can use these operators, relational and logical operators, to create Boolean expressions. So a Boolean expression is something that evaluates to true or false. So here we have some variables. We just say we have integers uh, a, b, i, j, and result. You can see the values they're equal to. And we can create some expressions using the operators, uh, relational and logical. So for example, we might say, uh, is a greater than b? Again, these are all tests. So uh, it evaluates the expression, the contents of A, are they greater than B? And in this example, it says true. Uh, because A contains 8, B contains 2. So yes, that is true. Now here we have A greater than B, where we have single quotes. And again, that means uh, this is a character. So character A, the ASCII code for lowercase a, is that greater than the ASCII code for lowercase b? And it says false because a, the ASCII code for character a is 97, which is the number, uh, the ASCII number for a, and for b it's 98. So what it's comparing is it's comparing the numbers. So 97 is not uh, greater than 98. So the greater than comparison is false. Then we have ASCII a plus 1. And you can uh, do math on ASCII. They are just numbers after all. So what do you get? Well, you get the next, if you add one, you get the next character. So uh, ASCII A plus one, is that equal to uh, lowercase ASCII B? And yes, it is. Turns out it is true. And again, we can see that up here. So we take uh, ASCII A 97 and add one. You do in fact get 98, and that's the code for B. So character A plus one does equal character B. So you can perform math on characters. You can sort them uh, less than, greater than to sort things alphabetically. I equal J. Again, that's a test. Are they equal? And we can see up here that I is 15 and J is 30. And so that'll be false. No, those are not equal. So I equal J, that's false. And then A less than B. So A is 8 and B is 2. So that test will be false. And then we're going to OR those together with the OR logical operator, and false, OR'd with false, is false. So that entire expression is false. Then we have I greater than J, uh, OR'd with result. And so what is this doing over here? This uh, I greater than J, that's going to give us a true or a false. Uh, I 15 and J 30. So 15 greater than 30, this is false. Um, so, But what about the result over here? There's no less than, greater than test. It's just result, which is 3. What does that do when you use it in this sort of an expression? And what it does is, remember we talked about this, in C++, 0, the number 0, is used to represent false. Any other number, any non-zero number, positive or negative, doesn't matter, is considered to be true. So the variable result being equal to 3, which is a non-zero number, that will be considered true. So i greater than j is false, and we're oring that with 
3, which is interpreted as true. So we have a false or with a true, and that gives us a true result. Okay, and here's an example where you can do, uh, op you can have mathematical expressions, and you can use those as, as comparisons in your uh, relational expressions or Boolean expressions. So A divided by B. So it does this mathematical operation, uh, the, the value of A, which is 8, and B, which is 2. So it does 8 divided by 2. That result, that resulting value, is compared with the next term. And so 4 greater than 3, true, it is. And so that, that the left-hand side of the, of the AND expression is true, and then that's compared, or that's uh, logical ANDed with I is that less than or equal to 20, and you can see I is 15, and so that is, in fact, less than 20, so that's true. So we have true on this side and true on this side, so the AND operation is true. Now, when you uh, do these uh, expressions where it's doing some sort of calculation, that's a temporary result. We're not modifying A or B. We're just, it just does the, it takes the value of each, performs the operation. You get that temporary re result. That temporary result is used in the expression, and then it's just discarded, doesn't remember it anymore. We can compare strings. Uh, we saw the string uh, type, which contains multiple characters, including spaces. And when you compare strings, it is when you compare uh, one string to another, they're being compared character by character. So alphabetically, uh, character by character, and the, it's case sensitive, just like individual characters where you compare them, you have to be uh, the same case uh, to get the alphabetic comparison to work. The same is true for strings, so make sure you have the same case uh, characters. Again, you can, and the purpose for doing that would generally be to sort uh, the strings alphabetically. So here's some examples. We have a string str1, and maybe that's equal to uh, abc, lowercase, and string str2, uh, capital abc. Again, notice the double quote. That's how we designate uh, literal strings. And it says, if you compare those two, str1, str2, right, you say, are they equal, using the equal operator? So does string one equal string two? It'll tell you false. They are not equal. And they're not equal because they're, they're different cases of letters. So these are different uh, sequences of numbers. So they are not the same. And then if you said uh, string 3, uh, str3 is equal to abb. And then you said, is string 3 less than string 1? It's going to tell you true. Now, why is that? Why, why is string 3 less than string 1? And alphabetically, that would mean string 3, str3, occurs uh, alphabetically before uh, str1. And the reason is it's going to go through and compare character by character. So we're comparing 1 to 3. So it's going to compare the first character in 1 and the first character in 3, and those are the same. So it'll go to the next character, and those are the same. And then it'll go to the third character, and when it gets to the third character of the comparison, uh, str3 is going to be comparing lowercase b and it's going to be comparing that to lowercase c and str1, and b occurs alphabetically before c, and so therefore str3 is alphabetically before str1. So that's less than would be true. You can compare real numbers, and we've looked at integers and characters and strings. Uh, real numbers can be compared. You have to be a little careful uh, with real numbers. Um, we're talking about doubles and floats, the C++ types. Whenever you store uh, real numbers in C++, they're stored with limited precision. Um, it, that is, it's not possible to store every conceivable real number. There's an infinite number of real numbers, and we have a finite amount of storage in the computer, so we can't possibly store them all. And so the, the trade-off is when you store real numbers in order to allow us to accommodate the infinite range, we have a limited precision. And that can cause some issues when you try to compare real numbers. So we'll see how to do that to, to work around those issues. So when uh, the, uh, the problem occurs, uh, the potential problem occurs when you want to compare 
the result of some expression. That, it, that you're doing a calculation, the uh, calculation is using real numbers and you're getting a real number result and you want to compare that calculation to some other real number. That's when the problem can occur and that's when you have to be careful. So here's an example. So we have, uh, here's a real uh, number expression. That's x and y are real variables and we're doing some sort of calculation. In this case we're doing a divide. So x divided by y. Alright, so that's going to give us a real number. We want to know does this result equal 0 0.35. Now that looks pretty straightforward. It looks like that should work. The problem is with this limited precision. Even though x divided by y should really equal 0 0.35, it may not equal it exactly. That is, uh, you've all seen this when you've done some calculations on a calculator and the answer was supposed to be 1 and instead of displaying 1 the calculator displayed 0 0.9999 a bunch of nines. That sort of thing is what we're talking about. So uh, we have x divided by y and really it should be 0 0.35 but it may not be 0 0.35 exactly. Maybe it's going to be uh, 0 0.3499999 or 0 0.3500001. So maybe it's just a little bit off from being 0.35 and if you did the comparison, it would say false. They're not equal. That's the problem. It's supposed to be equal, but because of the limited precision, or some people would say rounding issues, rounding errors, uh, because of that, they're not equal, but they should be. So how do we work around that? Well, here's what you can do. Whenever you want to do this sort of comparison with real numbers, again, it has to be when you've done some sort of calculation. If you just want to compare two uh, real values, a real variable, real variable, or, or real variable to literal, it's fine. You can go ahead and do it. It's It only occurs when you do some calculations and then you want to compare that to some real number. Here's what you do. You take the two terms you want to compare and you take the difference between them. So here's our x divided by y and I want to compare that to see if it's equal to 0 0.35. So just take the difference between those two and then take the absolute value of that now, why absolute value? Well, we don't know which one of these terms is greater, so this might result in a negative number. And we don't want a negative number, we just want the, the absolute difference between the two, so absolute value of that. Now we have a number which represents, and it's always going to be a positive number, we have a positive number which represents the difference between these two terms. So then we compare that number with some constant that we declare in our code. Here's an example. Maybe maybe this is the value of your constant. I called it epsilon. Call it whatever you want. So here's epsilon. I've, I've defined it previously as a constant. Here's the number I gave it. I'm going to compare this difference, this absolute value difference between these two terms. And if that difference is smaller than this number, I'm going to say that's close enough those two are equal. So all of this will be true, this expression here will be true, if these two terms, this term and this term, are very very close to the same number. And that's that's close enough. Now what do you use for epsilon? That depends how precise you want that comparison to be and it depends on the type of variables that you're using. If you're using doubles, doubles have more precision. So you can make this a smaller number. You can add more zeros in front of the one. If you're using floats, floats have fewer digits of precision, so you want to use a number like this. And so that's how you that's how you do the, the comparison of uh, the, the result of a calculation that gives you a real result to some other real result. Alright, so how do we actually use these comparisons in our code? In C++, we can make decisions using an if statement. And here's what the syntax of the if statement looks like. It's if, lowercase word if, and then where it says expression in parentheses, that is any expression that we've just seen that results in a true or a false. So anything you can write that results in a true or false, you can put in the parentheses. And the parentheses are required. So this is what you would write in here, where it says just replace expression with, with your 
uh, test, whatever it is. So A greater than B or something like that. And so whatever your test is goes in the uh, in place of where it says expression. If that expression is true, this next statement will run. If that expression is false, it skips the statement. So the statement runs if the expression is true, so it does this, and if the expression is false, it skips it. That's what the if statement does. And we can use that in our program to selectively run or not run statements of code. So our program can make decisions. Our program can behave differently based on these decisions. Now over here on the right we have something new. This is a flowchart. This is a flowchart that's representing the logic of the if statement. In the flowchart, the diamond shape is a decision. So in the diamond shape, we have if expression. Now, if I were creating, a, if I were flowcharting a real program, I would put, again, in place of expression, I would put the actual test. Maybe A greater than B would be in here. So maybe it would say if A greater than B. There's, for the if statement, there's two possibilities. This is either true or false. So the, the expression is either true or the expression is false. If the expression is true, it goes this way. It goes down here and it does something. So again, whatever this is, this is some C++ code. So here's our statement. If the expression is false, it skips around it and goes down here. And then this is the rest of the code down here. This is the rest of your program. So that's how you'd flow chart an if statement. So this is the, this is the uh, pictorial view or the high level view of the logic. You can see the flow of your program. It enters at the top and it, it reaches the diamond, which is a decision. It makes a decision and it flows in different directions. You can actually see the, the way the program uh, branches around or flows around this statement to make it do things, uh, make it perform differently. We also have an if else statement. And let's look at the flowchart first. So with the if else statement, how is it different? Well, if you have a true result, so that is the expression is true, just like before, just like with the if statement, it does something. If you have the expression is false, then it does something else. So instead of skipping statement one with the if else statement, it runs statement two. So the if else statement is an either or kind of a logic. So the expression has to be either true or false, one or the other. So if the expression is true, do statement one. If the expression is false, do statement two. And here's what the syntax looks like in C++. Again, if an expression, this is something that evaluates to true or false again in the parentheses. If that's true, do statement one. And if it's false, run statement two. Never both. It's one or the other. You either run statement one or you run statement two, but never both. So which one of these do you use? Do you use the if? Do you use the if else? Depends on the logic that you want. You know, what do you want your program to do? Do you want it to either run something or, or skip something? And then use the, use the if statement. Do you want it to run one or the other of something, either or kind of logic? then use the if else statement. And here's again the syntax, the if and then the, the word else, all lowercase. So let's take a look at an example of the if else statement. We have a program that says it's gonna prompt us to enter a taxable income. And it reads that in that taxable income value, says C in taxable, and then it does an if else. So it says if the uh, taxable input is less than or equal to some constant, which we have called wage limit. And then it says we're going to use this formula to calculate our taxes. So taxes are going to be equal to some constant rate one multiplied by the taxable uh, income. And then else, meaning the if uh, expression was false, so if taxable uh, less than or equal to wage limit is false, uh, then we're going to do this uh, expression. So taxes will be calculated uh, by saying rate 2 constant multiplied by uh, taxable minus wage limit plus bracket 1 tax. So you have to pay more tax. So if you made more money, you, you pay at a different tax rate, different bracket. So it's the program now, one program is actually doing, uh, behaving differently based upon the results of the decisions that it is making, the program is making. So if you entered, uh, if you have more uh, wages than exceeded the wage limit, it uses a different calculation. And again, it's one or the other. It's either going to use it's going to do uh, uh, this 
calculation to calculate your taxes or this one, one or the other. And then it displays the result. So let's take a look at this. I think I have this loaded up. So here's the example, a tutorial, or lecture four, example one, uh, the if else statement. And you can see our uh, constants. We have a wage limit we've declared uh, as 20,000. We have uh, the rate one constant, which is 0 0.02, and rate two, which is 0 0.025. And then the, the code we just saw, please enter your taxable income. Let's go ahead and run this. Here it is running. So please type in the taxable income. Okay, let's say we made uh, 25,000. There we go, 25,000. I press enter. It says taxes are 525. So I did this calculation and it did the, uh, there's the if statement, it did this input and it did this if statement and it compared taxable to our wage limit. So our wage limit was 20,000 and I entered 25,000. So it says 20,000, or excuse me, I entered 25,000. So 25,000 is that less than or equal to 20,000? And no, it's 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 not. This is that would be false. 20,000 is not less than or equal to 20, or 25,000 is not less than or equal to 20,000. So false is going to use this formula down here. So we had the higher tax bracket, and so there's our taxes that are due. So now if I run it again. Okay, so there it is running again. So now let's say uh, 19,000. So 19,000, now it's it's less than the wage limit. So now it says if taxable is less than or equal to wage limit, and yes, it'll be true. And so it'll do, it'll use this calculation down here uh, to calculate the taxes. So there you can see the, the result of that. Now let's take this opportunity to look at how to uh, use some of the debugging features in Visual Studio because now we're writing programs that are getting more complex. We're writing programs that are making decisions and when you run these programs and you want to test them, how do you know uh, if it's actually doing what you want? How do you know that the logic is correct for this if-else statement? And of course you could determine what the number should be and make sure it's giving you the correct result, which you should do, but I'm going to show you here briefly how to use the, uh, the nice debugging features, the nice testing features that are in Visual Studio. So what I want to know is, I want to know which of these statements is running. Is it is it doing this, using this equation, a calculation, or this calculation? And I'm going to put a breakpoint in my program to watch what happens. So the way you do that, if you see this gray bar here where I'm pointing, if you click next to the line where you want the program to stop, you'll get this red circle. And I have a breakpoint now, it's called. I've got a breakpoint in my program. So what will happen is, when I run this program, when the program reaches this instruction, this line of code, it will stop just prior to that line running. And then we can examine the variables, and we can actually step through the code and watch it run. So let's do that. So I'm going to go ahead and run it, and it says, please, please type in the taxable income. Okay, so I'm going to say, uh, let's do 19,000 again. Press enter. And now you see it has this, this yellow arrow inside the red circle, and that means it's it stopped. It's paused now. It, it reached the break point, and it's it's waiting to run this instruction. So again, this instruction has not executed yet. And down here in this uh, autos window, it'll display the nearby variables and constants. So it's displaying down here, it says wage limit is 20,000 and taxable, the number I entered, is 19,000. You can see that. And you can also point to it with your mouse. So if you, you just hover the your mouse cursor over the, the constant or variable, it'll display it up here also. So there's 20,000 and there's 19,000. Okay, so now what's it going to do? So taxable less than or equal to wage limits. Well, it's 19,000 here and it's 20,000 over here. So it should be true. Now here's what you can do. If you if you hold down your mouse button and highlight this expression just like that and then hover, it'll tell you the result. So it says, it says taxable less than or equal to wage limit is true. So it's telling you that it's going to interpret that as true. 
All right, let's watch what happens now. So true means it should go down here and run this instruction, this next one. So here's what we can do. Up here in the toolbar, we have step over and step into. Okay. So either one of these will run this instruction, the one we're currently on. It'll run this instruction, and then it will stop at the next instruction. It will not go beyond the next instruction. So I'm going to go ahead and click step over, or you can also press the function key F10. Okay, so it ran that line, it ran the if statement, and now you can see where the arrow is pointing. It says this is the next statement that will be executed, and now, now it's down here. It's inside the if, and so that's correct. It was true, and it went inside the if statement, and now it's about to run this instruction. So what's this going to do? So here's rate 1. You can see rate 1, and here's our taxable value. It's going to multiply those together, and it's going to store the result into the taxes variable. And so you can see, again, all the local variables right now, taxes is not initialized, so it has some strange number in it. So I'm going to, I'm going to do this step over. I'm going to run that instruction. And now you can see taxes contains 380, so it updated. So this was changed to 380. And now it's at the else, and the else, it's just going to skip over this next line, and it's, it's, it's going to go down to the, to the rest of the program, which will be the C out statement. So now if I click that, it's going to go down here, go to the C out, and it's going to display the result. So very, very uh, powerful debugging features in uh, Visual Studio. Again, you can, you can click this gray bar wherever you want to put a breakpoint, and when the program reaches that line, it stops, but it's still available to run, and you can click either step over or step into. We'll get into the differences between those two later on, uh, but right now we can just use step over and it'll run one instruction each time you click that or press F10. Now, if you've, if you've, you've finished uh, debugging and you want to just continue running the rest of the code without stepping, just go ahead and click Continue. Click Continue, and it'll run the program, uh, or the rest of the program, just like always. So, very, very handy. Uh, and then to remove those breakpoints, just, just click the circle, uh, the red circle, and it's removed. Okay, uh, what happens if you have multiple lines of code that you want to put inside uh, an if or an if-else statement? Uh, the examples that we saw previously, we had just one statement uh, in here. We had, we had if and then one statement, so it is one statement here, and then else and just one statement. What if I want more than one line of code in here? What do we do? Or more than one line of code down here, what do we do? Uh, well, we have to use compound statements. So compound statements in C++ are statements that are inside braces. So you just have an opening brace and you can put you can put code in there and then closing brace and that's a that's a compound statement or code block. So it depends on the book but either compound statement or code block. And then we can use that in those if statements uh, to put more than one line of code. Now there's an there's a something you got to you got to be aware of uh, with compound statements, some behavior that's, that can uh, change in C++. And that behavior is, if you declare a variable inside a code block that is inside braces, if you declare a variable, that variable may only be used within that block. So that's called a local variable. That variable is local to that code block. So here's an example. We have an opening brace and we have a closing brace. So there's a code block. And inside that, that code block or compound statement, we've declared a variable A. So here's variable A being declared. It says integer A equals 8. And we display it. See out A. That works fine. It displays the variable A. Now we're outside of the code block. So here's the closing brace. So we're no longer in this code block. And now we say see out A. And the comment says error. A does not exist. And that's because A was declared inside a compound statement or code block. So when you declare a variable inside braces, that's the only place you can use it. It does not exist outside those braces. And that can occur now because we're going to start using these braces in our programs inside if statements. So just be aware of that.
What if you put an if statement inside an if statement? And you certainly can do that. And those are called nested if statements. And so here's an example. I've got an if statement. And, and here's our code block or compound statement. So opening brace. And then inside this if statement, we have a second if statement. So if hour is greater than 6, and it says see out hello. And here's our closing brace uh, for our code block. And then it says else see out goodbye. So that's a nested if. So it says if, inside there's an if, and then else, and then see out goodbye with braces. Here's the same code without the braces. And it says the logic is different without the braces. Now, it's not an error. The, both of these will compile. There's no errors. There's no warnings. There's nothing wrong in terms of C++. There's something different about the logic. So it's the same code. This and this are the same. This one has braces. This one does not. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to figure out what's different. So there, there's your assignment. Figure out what's different about these two. What's this one do differently or different from this one? There's something different about the logic, so be careful about that. Make sure you figure out what it is. Okay, chaining if else statements. In C++, you can uh, use this if else chain or chained if statements. You start with an if statement just like always, so if some relational expression, something that evaluates to true or false, and then you can have a statement in there. And then you can say else, like we saw before, but then following else, you can put another if. Immediately after the else, you can put an if. And you can keep doing that. So you can say else if, else if, else, as long as you want to do that. And then optionally, this is optional, at the bottom, you can have else by itself. This is, a, this is a chained uh, if-else statement or if-else chain. So you start with an if and do else if, else if, else if, as, as many as you want, and then optionally an else at the bottom, and then some statement down there. Now what does this do? Well, it behaves like a normal if statement uh, in, in the beginning. It does the test, uh, it does this first if, and it does this, whatever this expression is, is this true or false. If that's true, it runs this statement. Okay, that's what you would expect an if statement to do. So this statement runs when the, uh, when the if is true. And then it would exit the if else chain, if that's what happened. It would go all the way down here to the rest of your code. It would exit the if else chain completely. If this first expression is false, it'll go to the else, and it'll do the second if. So it'll do this if expression. And if this one's true, then it will run the statement below that. It'll run this line. And it, if it runs that line, then it will exit the if-else chain. It's going to keep doing that all the way down. So it's, it says, is this one true? If it's false, goes to the next if. Is this one true? If it's false, goes to the next if. Is this one true? It keeps doing that until it finds an if statement that's true, or until it reaches the optional else at the end, and if it reaches the else, then it runs this statement. So none of the previous if statements were true. Do this, and then it exits the if else chain. If you don't have this, if you don't have this optional else, you don't have this line, then and none of the ifs are true, it does nothing. It just basically it does tries all the ifs, nothing's true. It would just fall through without doing anything. So that's the if else chain. Now there's a behavior to this if else chain that we need to be aware of. We just saw the conditional test, they start at the top and it stops when the first true condition is found. Here's what you've got to be aware of. Because it stops as soon as the first true condition is found, if we get the comparison operators reversed, that is, if the comparisons we're using are uh, greater than or greater than or equal test, we must test the large values first. If we're using a less than or less than or equal test, we must test the small values first. 
let's go back here, scroll up one to go back to my example. So here we're using a greater than test and we're testing 50,000. And the next test is a, a greater than or equal test and we're testing for 40,000. So the largest value 50,000 is first. That's correct. That's what you want. If you reverse that, if we had 20,000 first, so if it was said 20, 30, 40, 50, the logic would not be correct. So let's take a look at this example. I have this example program. We'll take a look at it in the in the actual Visual C++. And then we'll see what happens when you reverse those uh, values. Reverse that, uh, that, put a small numbers first. So this is uh, example two. Here it is. So it's if else chain. And you can see we have our monthly sales and our income. And it says enter monthly sales, and see in monthly sales. And then it says if monthly sales is greater than 50,000, just like, just like we saw, then 40, then 30, then 20. So this is correct the way it's written. Let's go ahead and run that just to make sure it works. So here we go. Enter our monthly sales. Let's let's put uh, let's make the 40,000 one the one that's true here. So not greater than 50, but but greater than or equal to 40. So let's say 45,000. Go ahead and press enter. And it says there's your sales commission. So this is the line that ran. It said your sales commission is three hundred fifty dollars plus 0.14 multiplied by monthly sales, and there's there's the result. That, so that works correctly. Now what happens if? Oh no, again, and I, let me prove that to you that it did this one. Let's put a breakpoint here just to prove that it did what I said it did. So I'll run this one more time just to prove that. So again, forty-five thousand. And there you can see it stopped. It did in fact stop on that line. So just to prove that that was the instruction that ran, that was the formula that was used uh, to calculate the, the the monthly sales. Okay, so let's change this. So what happens if I have the smaller values first? So this is 20, and this is 30, and this is 40, and this is 50. And then of course I would need to change the formulas also. Uh, so I'm not going to bother moving all those, but let's just pretend I did. So let's pretend I took uh, this one and put it down here uh, for 50,000, and this one and moved it up here for 20. Let's see where it stops now. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll put a breakpoint on each one of these. Let's see which one of these it stops on. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna 45,000 again. And it stopped right away. But again, I did not move the formulas. This would be the wrong formula. This says 20,000. So this should be the formula for 20,000, not the formula for 50,000. But it stopped right away. Now, why did it stop? Well, we have the small values first. And if you put the small values first, the test says if monthly sales is greater than this. Well, every number that's greater than 20,000, this will be true. It'll never, the code, the if else chain, will never reach the greater than 30 test. Because I entered 45,000 and 45,000 is greater than 20. True, we're done. That's the if else chain says, okay, 45,000 is greater than 20. Uh, use this formula again, which I, if I had moved it would have been the wrong formula. And it's done, it's, it exits right away. So if you put the if you get the logic reversed on this if else chain, if you if you put if you're using greater than tests, and you put your small values first, you'll never get down to the other uh, the, the else statements. It'll always be true. You'll never get to the proper formula to do the calculation. And if you're doing a less than test, then you put the small values first. So don't don't forget that. Very very important. Let's use this example to talk about uh, putting braces in if statements. Uh, compound statements. So I'll just go to the if statement, I'll press enter, and I'll do the uh, type the left brace. And as soon as I do, Visual Studio goes ahead and puts the, the closing brace in there for me. I'm actually going to move that one down one line, put it below this income statement. So now we have a compound statement inside the if. Uh, we can add as many lines of code in here as we want, and they will all be part of the, the true part of this if statement. This this is the if else chain. Of course, it's the same for the if or the if else. So if that's true, all of the code between these braces will run. And that's how you put multiple lines of code inside your if statements. Same thing for the uh, else or the else if. 
go to the end of the line, opening brace, closing brace, and again, as many lines of code as you want. Visual Studio is automatically indenting, putting the code wherever it wants. Sometimes you'll see people put the opening brace at the end of the line and then the closing brace on the, the, the row below. Visual Studio, or C++ for that matter, doesn't care. I don't necessarily like that myself. I like the formatting to be uh, the braces in the same column. Makes it easier for me to see the code when I'm uh, looking at your code, looking at your programs uh, in the classroom. So I like to see that opening brace and closing brace in the same column. That's essentially what Visual Studio does if you're typing the code for, uh, fresh. If you press enter, press a brace, and then type the code, that's what you'll wind up with. So that's what I want to see. So now we can go ahead and put multiple lines of code in here just to demonstrate that it works. Let's throw a C out statement in here. Okay, this is, let's see, this is line one for lack of a better thing to put in there. And that will now run if the uh, if the first if is true, and you can go ahead and put multiple lines of code down here in these others as well, as many as you want. So that's how you put uh, use compound statements or, or code blocks with if statements. I also noticed uh, when I copied and pasted some of the code into the PowerPoint that some of the indentation got changed. Uh, so this is the default indentation. This is the way I want the if statement is uh, that the, the I in the if statement is in the same column as the opening brace and then lines up with the else and all the, the lines below it. So if you see that in the PowerPoint that it looks like the indentation is a little bit different. That's just because it got changed. I didn't notice it. But this the way Visual Studio does it, the indentation, the default in, indentation that it uses, that's what I want you to use. Conditional operator. Um, I, I don't use this myself. I don't like using conditional operator, but it's important that you understand it and know what it does because you will encounter it. The conditional operator, is, the question mark is used. It's actually just if else logic in a very, very shortened or shorthand form. Uh, I think it's hard to read. That's why I don't like using it. And I don't, there's no advantage. There's no, uh, uh, the code does not run faster. It's no better than if else, which is why I don't like using it. It's, it's just harder to read, and there's no advantage. Uh, but again, you know, C++ programmers, it's part of the language uh, that you will see it used, so you need to understand what it does so you can read the code. And to be perfectly honest, sometimes code can be very obscure, very hard to read. Sometimes I have to actually sketch it out, uh, either flowchart or to sketch it out, just to make sure I really understand what's going on with when conditional operators are used. So here's what it looks like. You put a question mark. That's your conditional operator. On the left is your expression. That's the thing that's true or false. So here's your true false expression. Then you put question mark. And on the right, this is where you put the, the terms that would be either uh, executed when the expression is true or false. So the first uh, following the question mark, the first expression here, this is what's executed if the expression is true. And then you put colon, and then you put the expression that's executed when uh, the statement, that, statement that's executed if the expression is false. So it's really if else logic. So here, here's a greater than b question mark x equals 1. Uh, colon x equals 2. Here's the same exact code written using an if else statement. This is what this says. If a is greater than b, then put 1 into x. Put x equals 1. Put the value 1 into x. Else, put the value 2 into x. So if this is false, a greater than b is false, then 2 goes into x. That's what this says. It's exactly the same thing. All of this says this. This if else statement is much easier to read. Programmers who are not familiar with C++ can still read this. Almost every programming language has an if statement. And so if, even if you didn't know C++, you could look at that code and read it. If you don't know C++, you're not going to be able to read that. That's very obscure, hard to read. So that's why I don't like using them. And there, there's no difference. And once the program is compiled, once you get the actual executable code, it's exactly the same thing. 
switch statement. Here's another way that we can make decisions in C++. It's sort of like the if-else chain. Uh, in fact, it's very much like the if-else chain. It's just more restricted in what you can do. So let's take, and it looks quite quite different. The syntax is a lot, very much different, but, but the logic is the same. So you put the word switch. Now, here where it says expression, this is not a true-false type of expression like we saw with the if statements. Uh, in the switch statement, this expression is something that must result in an integer value or integral value. Uh, characters are considered to be integers, so this can be something that results in a character or it can be a character variable, for example. But So this is something that is an integral, uh, results in an integral integer number or character, or is it a, a variable integer or character variable. So switch on that expression, and then you always have the brace. So opening brace, closing brace defines the boundaries of the switch. And then inside you put the word case, this is part of the statement, and value. Now where it says value, and then colon, value, and then colon, and you must have the colon there, this term, this variable, this uh, constant, this literal, whatever it is, whatever you put here, is compared with the expression to see if they're equal. So the switch statement does an equality test. Is the expression equal to this value? If it is, if that's true, if these two are equal, then it goes in to the case and it runs the statements that you have down here. And you can have more than one statement. You don't need extra braces here now, like we saw with the if. It runs these statements. So it runs statement one, it runs statement two. It continues running statements until it runs a break. The break statement exits the switch. So when break runs, it will exit the switch completely. It'll go all the way down here to the rest of your code and continue running the rest of your program. If the, the expression and the value do not match, if they're not equal, then it goes to the next case statement and it compares the expression with value two. Are those equal? If those are equal, it runs the, the code in here. I didn't put the code, I just put dots, but whatever the code is, runs the code down here again until it reaches break and then it would exit. If you have multiple cases so I have case value two colon, case value three colon. There's an implied or logic. So just putting multiple cases gives you or, logical or, for those values. So the expression is compared to value two. If it doesn't equal, it's compared to value three. If it's equal, it runs the code down here until it reaches break and then it exits the switch. So there's an implied or logic. You notice you don't have the or, the logical or symbol in here. The the logical or is implied just by the fact that you have these these cases one following the other, and they don't have to be on the same line either. Uh, that this case statement here could be down here on this line below this this one above. So it could say case value two colon, and then down here it could say case value three colon. And you can have as many as you want. There's no limit. You're not limited to just uh, two cases with implied or. You can just keep listing them as many as you want, and you have implied or logic between all of them. There's no way to do AND logic. You can get this implied or logic in a switch, but there's no way to get AND. And you're, you're not allowed to use the ampersands, uh, two ampersands, to get AND logic either. You only get implied or. And then optionally, you can have default colon. If none of the cases match, that is, you did all these comparisons, nothing matched, then default, this statement runs. Now, you don't need break down here because uh, that's the end of the switch, so it always exits, but that's how the switch statement works. Now, there's a very uh, interesting behavior with switch. If you don't put the break in there, what happens is, if this case is the one that matches, so let's say this expression and value 1 are equal, and this code starts running, so it runs statement 1, it runs statement 2, and there's no break, it'll fall through 
the next case tests that is it will not do these tests it just skips over those it'll it'll fall through those and it'll go to the code below there and run that code and it keeps running it keeps doing that it keeps skipping over the case statements and running the code until it either encounters a break or it reaches the end of the switch statement and that's the design behavior of the switch so if you actually want the switch to stop if you want it to exit you must use the word break if you don't put the word break in there it'll just keep going it just keeps running all that code until it gets to the end that's the way it's designed to work so again it's it's if else logic but it's it's quite a bit different that all the restrictions it's integer only integer character only doesn't equal test only there's no greater than uh, there's no less than kind of tests and implied or is all you get you don't have any way to do and so it's a much more restricted form of the if else uh, if else logic so here's an example of switch with this fall through behavior uh, where it's going to do a switch on model number and then it says case 3 and it says okay if you have uh, if your model number is case 3 it's going to display custom backpack case and notice there's no break so it's going to fall through and it's going to display DVD player recorder and then again no break it's going to fall through and it's going to say core i7 CPU and then there's a break so again here's the break so now that's going to make it exit the switch and notice break can be on the same line C++ doesn't care about things like uh, putting statements on the same line you can you can write your entire program on one line if you wanted to I would not recommend that It'd be very hard to read but all C++ requires is that you end your statements with a semicolon wherever it wants and when you do that you can put statements on the same line which is quite commonly done and here's an example of that where it says C out uh, semicolon and then break semicolon so let's take a look at this uh, example okay so here's our example and it says uh, enter the model number and then it reads in the model number which is an integer and it says display the features of the model whatever number computer are so we're entering model numbers for a computer and it's going to tell us the features of that model number and if we enter model 3 it'll display a custom backpack case DVD player recorder core i7 if we enter model 2 it'll display just DVD player recorder core i7 if we don't enter a valid number and all the cases are false it'll go down here to default and it'll say invalid model number so we have valid numbers are one two three and then anything else would be invalid let's go ahead and run this here it is running so enter model number let's let's try three first of all so model three and there we go so switch model three and it did in fact compare three to model number and they were they matched so it says the features of the Model 3 computer are custom backpack case, DVD player recorder, Core i7 CPU. So it displayed all of those. And then break, it exited the switch. So now let me run this again. Okay, now I'll enter 2. So it'll skip over the 3, case 3, but it'll do case 2. So there's 2. And there's 2. So it, it says DVD player recorder. Core i7 CPU. So it did not do the first one, did not do three, but it did two and one. And then let's do one more. Let's do an invalid number. So let's say model number four. Okay, there's no model number four. It says the features of the model four computer are. It's an invalid model number. So there's no four. It did not match anything. It went to default and it said invalid model number. So there's an example of, of the switch with the with the fall through, through behavior uh, when you don't put break in there. Here's the flowchart for the if-else chain or the switch. Uh, this happens to be an if-else chain and we know that because we see a greater than test over here and we see a less than test over here and we know a switch can't do that. A switch can only do equal tests uh, but the, the symbols would be the same so you could uh, use the same layout uh, for a switch statement to flowchart it. It's just this, these would all be equal tests. So where it says condition and then question mark uh, in your actual flowchart, uh, you might put the word if in here. Uh, you might put uh, the word switch, or you might just put the question mark in there. I don't think you need the word condition, but that's where the the, the test is is being uh, represented by this by this diamond. 
and you just label the flow lines. So the flow line comes out of there, and here's the path that it follows when A is greater than B. And here's the path that it follows when A equals B and A less than B. And so it goes down here and runs, if A is greater than B, it goes down here and runs statement one. And there can be multiple statements. There can be another statement down here uh, that does something different, and you just keep listing them. And then the flow lines all come back together, and then it goes to the rest of the program, that rest of the flow chart. So again, that would be either uh, if else chain or switch, how you would flow chart those. You can also do it this way if you don't want the uh, flow lines to branch down uh, across and drop down vertically, just drop the flow line down and branch across horizontally. Same sort of idea. Again, you could have uh, multiple statements or things going on in here. You could have other symbols over here and just have a big long string of them. And they all come back together again and they go to the rest of the code. So either way, again, just label the flow lines. Now there's some common errors I see uh, in code, uh, partly because other languages do things like this uh, that C++ does not do. Here's a very common mistake, and that is we want to put a decision. Now this is shown in an if statement, but it could be any kind of a, a statement. We want to do a test we want to test to see if these two things are equal. Does choice, does the variable choice equal one? Very common mistake. In, in basic language, for example, this is how you would do it. This would work. But in C++, what does this do? This is not the equal test. This is not are these two equal. One equal sign is the assignment operator. So what that says is, it says, take this term and put it in that variable. And it will do that. And you will not get an error. This will compile. Now you might get a warning depending upon your compiler settings. But you can't guarantee that. You can't guarantee that the compiler will give you a warning. So what it does is, it'll say, okay, you want me to put this term into this variable. I will do that for you. The question now is, what does the if statement see? It doesn't see true false. What the if statement sees is it sees the value that was assigned. So as far as the if statement is concerned, it looks like that number is inside the parentheses. So it looks like this says if 1. And what do we know about that? That's true. 0 is false. Any other number is true. So in C++, this would compile when you ran the code, it would always be true. It would always display this. It would never reach the else statement because it's never false. It's always going to be true because it's always going to assign one to choice. It's also replacing what was in choice. If you had entered choice earlier in the code, when you reach this line of code, all of a sudden the number that was in there has not been replaced with a one. That is a very common mistake, so watch out for that. Testing and debugging, I show the I demonstrated the putting breakpoints in your code. Very, very powerful. Uh, take some time to play with that. That that is very, very handy. Uh, testing your logic and, and looking for mistakes in, 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 in your code. When you are testing, how do you go about testing a program? What's a good test plan? All right, so here's a very minimum test plan. Every statement in the program should be tested at least once. What does that mean? When you're running your code and you're entering test values, enter test values that will force each line of the program to run at least once. So if you have an if statement, you have to enter test values that cause the if to be true and then run it again and cause it to be false. And if you have an if else, same thing enter something the true, enter something that makes it false. If you have a switch statement, you have to enter test values that will cause each case to be reached in the switch, a switch statement. Same idea. So every statement must be tested at least once. It may not be practical to test every possible outcome of larger programs. Now that means if the program is doing a calculation, mathematical calculation, it's not practical to test a program to, to have it generate every possible outcome. It would take forever, literally. It would be there's no way to do it on some programs. Program debugging tools we saw uh, in the case of Visual Studio, very very nice uh, debugging tools. 
putting breakpoints in there and stepping uh, through the code and examining the contents of variables. Super, super way to do it. If you don't have that uh, ability uh, to uh, use a tool like Visual Studio for debugging, a simple tool that you can use is right in your code, you can just embed cout statements. Just add extra cout statements in your code and display things like variables or, or messages just so you know the program has reached that point. So what do you want to know? You want to, I, I want to know when the program reaches this line, what does variable x contain? Well, just put a cout statement in there, cout x. Maybe a little heading, you know, cout and then x equals and then put the value of x. That's a, that's a very handy way to debug if you don't have the, the ability to do things like Visual Studio does. When you find an error, make sure you correct that error and then start your testing over again. Because, and this happens more than you would think, you may have introduced new errors. So in the process of fixing one, you may have broken something else. Very, very important that you go back and do your testing over. And I did not put it here because it's not really a testing thing, but when you're working on your programs, keep backup copies and don't erase the copy that you have of something that's working. That is, uh, when you get a, when you're working on a program and you get to a point where it's where it's doing something, you've typed in a lot of code. Maybe it's not even running yet, but you've spent a lot of time typing your code. Save that, you know, just save that folder somewhere, copy it and then continue working. And then when you get to a point where something else, you've done a lot of typing or something's actually working, save that and, and use a different name, version one, version two, version three, and then continue working and keep those backups. What happens, especially in large programs, what can happen is this sort of thing here, that is you are working on a large program, you find an error, you go into the code to correct the error, and you may have, without knowing it, introduced an error somewhere else in the code. Now, you don't know that. It Weeks, months, years may go by before that error is discovered. Now, let's hope not, but, but it's possible. Well, now, how do you go back and figure out what's broken? You, you don't realize that what you changed months ago broke something else until the error is discovered. Now you know there's an error, but you don't know what caused it. Why it all, what, you know, it was working before. Why did it stop working? If you have all those previous versions of your code, you can compare them. You can go back in time to previous versions of your program and run those older versions until you find one where the error is not there. You know, again, we're talking about two errors here. We fixed one thing, or, or maybe we didn't fix an error. Maybe we just made a change. We thought we were making the program better, and we inadvertently broke something. You can go back in time to run those earlier versions until you find one that does not have this, this newly discovered error. And then you can compare the source code. You, okay, here's one where the error did not exist. And here's one where the error was introduced. What's different? What, what changed between those two programs? And there's a very nice tool for comparing source uh, code. It's called WinMerge. One word, do a Google for it. W-I-N-M-E-R-G-E. -E. And it's a free open source program you can download and install. And it does a side-by-side -side comparison on the screen. You can compare two programs and it will highlight all the differences. Uh, very, very nice tool for that sort of, of what happened, what changed, what caused something to stop working that was working. Very, very good way to do that. Okay, so review. We had a lot in this chapter. So conditional operators, we saw these are doing uh, comparisons and it gives you a true-false result. So here's uh, are two things equal, are they not equal? And you can see the others. Uh, logical operators, uh, logical and, logical or, and logical not. We talked about comparing real numbers and the potential problem that exists there where you want to watch out for comparing real numbers. You want to do the absolute value and compare the difference or to some constant. Uh, if else or if else and if statements, or if and if else statements, uh, where you can use these to make decisions. Nested if statements, 
and look at those two examples in the PowerPoint here. Figure out what's different between those two. Uh, chaining if statements, if else chain, we looked at those. And then logically, sort of the same thing, uh, the switch statement. We looked at the switch statement.